this uh, session will be a conversation between uh, three speakers that were very happy accepted the invitation to join us to warm up and dive into the topic of copyright and digital transformation of the heritage sector. Um, it's a really interesting moment to be having this conversation because we're at a sort of moment of impasse with a directive that is likely to change how copyright is shaped across Europe that is currently being transposed, but also a public consultation um, on the opportunities offered by digital technologies for the cultural heritage sector that was recently closed and that might lead to a revision of the key policy document that has been leading the digital transformation of the sector in the past uh, around 10 years. Um, the 2011 recommendations on digitization of cultural heritage. So it's a great time to have this discussion and reflect upon the past, the where we stand and what comes next or even where we want to go next uh, on copyright and digital transformation. Although don't worry, Anne, Paul and Dorothea, I won't be asking you to predict the future, although I'm, I'm sure you could do some very accurate guesses. Um, so we will hear uh, from three great speakers. Dorothea, Anne, and Paul, so let me quickly introduce you to them. Dorothea studied law, politics, and empirical cultural science and has a Master of Business Administration. She has performed several functions and is since 2008 head of Central Administration of the German National Library and therefore responsible for legal advice and public policy as well as copyright issues. Anne Bergman is a medieval historian by training coupled with a legal degree on IP law and for the last years, Anne has worked to support the European publishing community through her role as director of the Federation of European Publishers. She actively participated in discussions throughout the adoption of the copyright in the digital single market directive in Europe, representing the views of the book industry. <clears throat> Paul Keller is an activist and consultant working on the intersection of digital policy, copyright technology and cultural heritage. On behalf of cultural heritage institutions, he's been advocating for more flexible corporate policies that better align with the needs of an inclusive digital society. Paul also serves as an expert observer on the European Foundation Board. And in the past, as director of Kenny's Land, Paul has been instrumental in writing Europeana's public domain charter and Europeana's licensing and publishing frameworks. And so to the public, note that you can uh, type your questions, as Julia said, through the Q&A button anytime during the discussion, and we will try to introduce them as the discussion goes. You can also vote, there's a little uh, sign with a thumbs up. So you can vote for questions that you like, so we will try to prioritize them. And so to start, I'd like to give each of you the floor to share with us some of your general thoughts on the topic of copyright and the role it has in the digital transformation of the cultural heritage sector. So maybe we can start with Paul. I think you had a nice overview prepared that will um, give us some context. Yes, if somebody could. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> and thanks for the introduction, Ariadna. Um, if somebody could give me either control over the slides or could move to the next slide, whatever is easier. Um, as Ariadna has mentioned, I've been working with Europeana for the past 10 years. So I've uh, only recently transitioned out of this role. So I'm speaking about a lot of things here that I've done on behalf of Europeana in the past. Currently, I'm, I'm still sitting on the board, but I'm, I'm not involved in these things anymore. And um, I think it is worth at this point, and various speakers before in the, in the non-public session have also done this to some degree, to go back and, and look at how the cultural heritage sector's perspective on copyright policy has evolved over the years. And so if we look back 10 years, uh, in 2010, um, we had a bit of a resurgence or the, the topic really come to the forefront in the sense that the sector realized this is something that we not only complain about, but that we can take an active role in shaping about. And so 2010 saw the, publish, uh, the, the publication of Comunia's public domain manifesto and uh, shortly thereafter Europeana's own public domain charter. That's only 10 years ago. Like if we go on to the next slide, and I'm not sure if my um, so in 2011, that's nine years ago, nothing in the EU copyright framework was enabling digital availability of cultural heritage institutions. And this is, and Gail mentioned that in her keynote, is when the EU recommendation on 
and copyright and uh, uh, digitization of cultural heritage or the digitization of the cultural heritage sector came out which addressed some of the, the, the copyright concerns, most notably maybe taking up this call that came from the sector that public domain works really must remain available after digitization. Um, and it is only in, and I'm again, I'm not sure if I'm moving this thing or somebody else is doing that, but like the next slide. Um, I don't think there's anything happening when I, and it's only in 2014 when the first intervention of the US legislator in the copyright space happened with the EU Often Works Directive, which was a very careful, um, which was a very careful um, uh, introduction that was very limited in scope and uh, uh, around a lot of safeguards. A lot of us have been very critical of this instrument as being too limited and too burdensome. And I think by now it is fair to conclude to say that it has had a very limited effect, next to no effect on the sector, right? Like there's also a consultation going on or a review of that thing that will probably unearth more data shortly. Um, another thing that happened in 2014 was that we had a new European Parliament that put copyright reform or copyright reform was on the agenda for that legislative per period. And uh, I wanna show, um, a, a, a photo, this is a younger version of all of us speaking at a hearing in November in the European Parliament. It's me in the background in front of the European flag and you see Anne at the very back of that table in the middle is a, a young Pirate Party MEP called Julia Reda who took an outside role in discussions about copyright reform in the next years. And this was an event on copyright and the digitization or on cultural heritage and at this presentation at this event i gave a presentation that was titled culture heritage institutions deserve better um and that was really the feeling going into this copyright reform process that started in 2014 or was emerging on the horizon in 2014 and really came into being in 2016 when the european commission proposed the copyright in the digital single market directive which included provisions for the preservation and improving access to out of commerce works. So we had been hurt by that time. From 2016 to 2019, this directive was very intensively discussed, um, mainly on other issues, not the ones that uh, related to cultural heritage that proved to be decisive. Um, and actually what we saw in the shadow of the big discussions about things called upload filters, and uh, the press publishers' rights and even text and data mining were somewhat more controversial than the issues around access to cultural heritage and preservation was that we saw a, a, spirit, a more collaborative spirit between rights holder representatives, organizations like the Federation of European Publishers represented by UN, but also collecting societies and cultural heritage institutions really trying to find ways of making things work. And that in 2019 uh, resulted in the adoption of the directive. And I want to highlight two things here, although they've been highlighted by Gail before as well. One thing is that the DSM directive 10 years or nine years after the public domain manifesto and communias uh, or in the, the public domain charter enshrines that principle that things that have been in the, digital, in the public domain in analog form should not take should not be taken out of the public domain by the mere act of digitization into the EU legal framework, right? Like so, that's quite a success. And another success are the introductions of mandatory exceptions aimed at our sector, um, which deal with uh, digital preservation, text and data mining, and also substantial provisions for access to out of commerce works, as highlighted previously as well. So we're really now in a position where. If we're looking back, and it's a year later, it's a bit more than a year later now, if we're looking back, we've really gotten a lot of the things that we have asked for as a sector. As a sector, I think we can be super happy with the outcome of the, the copyright directive, and it is time for us to make this work. And I think Gail and others have referred to this in, in, in their previous contributions, that means currently that the member states need to implement these laws into or the, the provisions of the directive into their national laws. 
but it also means that for cultural heritage institutions, we need to get together and make them work. So we need to look at these provisions and see how we can work them, how we can increase access, how that can support the digital transformation of our sector. And uh, if we follow the spirit of many of these provisions, that means collaborations with rights holders. The Out of Commerce Works provisions look at a very delicate balance where some of it is licensing, some of it is exceptions, but in a way it is something we need to solve these problems that have blocked our work for the past 10 years together. And that's the, the, the phase that we're right in. As a sector, we need to show that we've been asking for improvements in the rules that govern our sector and that we're willing to work with them and make them work. And I wanna conclude with a little um, short view five years ahead in five years, the uh, a direct is the first year or the first moment in time when the directive can be reviewed by the EU legislator. So, and if they do that, we should learn some more. Um, but we also might, might think about what's on the horizon, how we can even further improve the EU copyright framework. And two things that come to mind here that are maybe suggestions for discussion also is further harmonization. A lot of the things that we are um, dealing with uh, in the new directive are still based on the principle of uh, territoriality. So things need to happen. We need to find arrangements in each and every member state separately. And another thing that might be interesting is a lot of the problems that are being caused in our sector is that there is insufficient registration of copyright. Registration is a very controversial topic, but we're seeing a lot of the solutions be that the EU IPO's databases some other aspects of the directive pointing in this way. And uh, I just also want to point back to work that's been done by the Finnish Council Presidency in 2019, at the end of 2019, also has looked at the importance of, uh, of, of copyright data, registration data to better manage the copyright space. Okay, thank you very much. And back to you, Ariadna. Thank you, Paul. So, and how do you feel about going next? Would you like to share? Me too. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, until the 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 last slide, I thought Paul could have been speaking on my behalf. I think that I can come back afterwards on on uh, what should happen in twenty twenty six. I just wanted to say that for uh, publishers whom I represent, copyright is the cornerstone of creation. And when several of you have spoken of uh, challenges uh, uh, with copyright, I would think we should look also in terms of opportunity. And uh, when I was asked, and thank you for the invitation to join this roundtable, I thought, okay, how can we, how can I look at the um, the impact of copyright on the cultural heritage? And I thought maybe it was because it was over the weekend, and I spent some time in my kitchen. I thought I'd look into a recipe. And um, for a good dish, you need the right ingredients, and you can start working on the preparation. For me, the absolutely uh, indispensable ingredients are understanding each other ecosystem and functioning, having balanced copyright rules and engage with the other parties. You, you'll see that the word engagement comes often in, in what I want to say as an opening remark. The ecosystem, I looked for a definition, and it's a community that lives in and interact with each other in a specific environment. And it is kind of obvious, at least to me, that there's a specific book ecosystem, starting obviously with the authors, but then uh, uh, going into the publishers, and then before books can reach the readers, we need booksellers and librarians. And authors, publishers, and booksellers, we have to rely on commercial successes to pursue our activities, while librarians serve the public with no commercial objectives. So that's where our interests start to slightly diverge. And in order to have an ecosystem that works, it has to be sustainable. So I'll give you an example, and this is true for one type of publication. It's probably, it's very different for other types of publication. For trade publications, so the one you can buy in a bookshop, we, uh, they relate largely on the commercial market. We've made an estimation a few years 
uh, ago. We should we should redo one uh, re uh, recently. That sales to libraries in most of the EU country represent about four percent of the turnover of publishers. Hence, ninety-six percent of the sales are done through uh, uh, of of the turnover is realized through individual sales for booksellers or online uh, retailers. Although we prefer booksellers. So that's the first thing: understanding the ecosystem and how it functions. Have balance room. Uh, I mentioned it before, the rules, and, and I think Paul mentioned it also, uh, it has to balance the legitimate interests of the authors and their publishers and uh, the access to culture. So the law has to be an incentive to find solution that benefits to everyone, to all the parties. And then uh, I would say it's either an ingredient or part of the preparation, but it's engaged with the other parties. And in order to make it work, the recipe itself is have clear objective. I think we lost ourselves a little bit in this debate on often works. I mean, it, it was at some point the most important issue to be solved. And it ended up that it was certainly not uh, uh, something enough for the cultural heritage institution and probably not very interesting for our sector either. So have clear objective and then see whether there's any way we can have our respective goal meet and work together. Like any uh, good meal or dish, it takes time, but it's quite worth it. Uh, Paul went through the, uh, the, the, the sort of timeline. I could say that we, we've been, uh, as FEP, we've been in every initiative from the high level group of, on digital libraries to the committee de Sage, which we worked with, or the uh, uh, MOU on out of commerce works. Uh, we even, although um, it, it failed, it, it wasn't as successful as we hope it would be, uh, we developed a software solution to uh, help a diligent search in Arrow. You can see that in the few countries where there's, or in the countries, I shouldn't say few, but in the countries where there's a long lasting tradition of cooperation, I'm thinking France and Germany, there has been solution even before the directive has been adopted as far as out of commerce. And as Paul said, I think it was very important that despite we were not only sitting on the same side of the table during the directive, the negotiation of the directive, we kept talking and we, we had messages that were not always heard, but I think that ultimately the, the, the results should be allowing us to facilitate dialogues and to find solution. We will, as publishers uh, association, will ask our members to engage as early as possible with their collective management organization, but also with libraries that intend to digitize their uh, collection. And we will be working with our collective management uh, organization so that they have the right negotiation mandate. Um, I saw that there were some colleagues from the EU IPO on the uh, earlier um, conference and I, I mean this is we have to work with them too together with the authors, the collective management organization and the libraries and Europeana so that the portal is a workable uh, instrument that will fulfill the needs of all parties. And just to conclude the recipes, I just want to attract your attention on a, uh, let's say, complex ingredient that came in the uh, solution. It's the issue of non-national works. You were talking of further harmonization, uh, Paul. I think that uh, this, this has created, at least for us, uh, an element of complexity. The fact that libraries can digitize works which have been published in other country and uh, whose authors whose the, the, the CMO are not directly representing. And therefore, we're going to have to build uh, even more platforms between the CMOs and the rights holders in, in various country will have to be extra careful so it doesn't spoil the dish that we are about to cook together. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. You're making us a bit hungry now.
<laughs> um, and um, I might ask you later if we have time what your views for 2026 are. I'm quite curious now. But then over to Dorotea, uh, if you'd like to share with us your general views on the topic. Yes, thank you, Ariadna. Uh, to be honest, there were a lot of arguments uh, made by Paul and Arden, uh, which I totally subscribe. But anyway, um, I think um, we should come back to libraries and, and cultural heritage um, institutions. And from my personal perspective, uh, the simple ancient Greek sentence, um, pantare, everything flows, describes pretty well the current situation of the intellectual property law. Because there is no other legal area which is much more in a move and widespread discussion, in particular within cultural heritage institutions. And when I go back, um, when I started joining the National Library in Germany almost 13 years ago, nobody really cared about these institutions from a legal perspective. This is my personal point of view. And in 2006, Germany had implemented legal deposit right for digital material. But in the following time, it became very clear that the copyright framework had to be adjusted in order to enable the GDL fulfilling its statutory mandate. And I think that's a very important issue. And therefore, we started to make national and European political players aware of this gap, which has to be closed. And to be honest, it took a long way to run. And in many respects, uh, it's still up in the air. And so we started with the stakeholder dialogue concerning out of commerce works in 2010, which ended up in signing the Memorandum of Understanding in which libraries, publishers, authors, and the collecting management societies had agreed to a set of key principles. Uh, but on the other hand, um, there was also clear, and it also underlined the necessity of statutory rules in order to achieve uh, legal certainty. And it was an essential aspect to address the needs of mass digitization by cultural institutions to avoid the so-called digital dark age. And that's the reason why, from my perspective, the Orphan Works uh, Directive really failed because um, this uh, needs a diligent search, we know. Um, it, the databases are very inappropriate. From my point of view, the documentation takes a lot of time and a lot of work, and each single work um, has to be licensed, even um, embedded works. Um, so, for instance, in Germany, we just started with one book and we had um, the book, we had photos, we had a map, and we had um, some database sheets inside this book. And it was a tremendous work to license this, this only item. So I think that's not very helpful in, in the future. And that was the reason why we very much um, concentrated on uh, the rules of out-of-commerce works. Um, let me say that the German rules on orphan works and out-of-print works in, um, was uh, implemented in 2013. And these rules transferred the directive um, of orphan works, but furthermore, um, the German legislator took the possibility to enable collecting management societies to grant rights for the use of out of commerce uh, works, print works published in Germany before 1966 by agreement. And this general agreement has been concluded between the Standing Conference of the Federal Ministers of Education and Cultural Affairs, the Collecting Management Societies VG Wort and VG Bildkunst, and cultural heritage institutions like um, the German National Library and others if they like to join. And this license allows these institutions to provide a public online access to digitized work for non-commercial use via digital collections, uh, also the German Digital Library and Europeana. 
um, the licensed object has to be registered by the German Patent and Trademark Office. And six weeks after the work has been listed, the license can be granted by the Collecting Management Society. And our rights holders always retain the right to object. Um, on this legal basis, um, the German National Library offers a national single access point to other cultural heritage institutions for out of commerce works since 2015. And I would like to uh, consider some data, figures and facts. Um, currently, 67 cultural heritage institutions are using the service. These are mainly state and university libraries with large collections, but also very specialized libraries, archives and museums with rare collections. And there are more than 32,000 licenses granted since starting the service, and we had only 13 objections, 10 by publishers. And I think this is really a successful story. And I would like um, also to introduce the German part of the national reform of the German Copyright Act, which introduced new exceptions and limitations for teaching, research and cultural heritage institutions in 2018. For instance, making digital copies, copies for um, researchers and scientific um, purposes preservation rules and especially the allowance of text and data mining. So we were for um, one step ahead before um, the DSM directive. Um, I think beyond all disputed discussions, let's face really the good things of the directive. These are for me the provisions regarding text and data mining and uh, the rules out of out of commerce works. And I think this is really um, a path which we have to, to go further and further. And let me say, even though the German law already allows text and data mining, for instance, many questions remained without reply. So I believe that the DSM directive puts the legislator in a position to create legal certainty to all stakeholders, to cultural heritage institutions, researchers, and especially rights holders. And let me say um, also um, the model um, or the, or the legal mechanisms of um, the out of commerce works. Uh, there are really very similar models uh, to the German model, the primary one in, in Article 8. I think this is a negotiation based model with the collecting management societies, and this is the model uh, what we would like to prefer. In all cases, rights holders must have the objection right to opt out. I think this is very important for the balance of um, the interests. And therefore, information about the out of commerce works must be published in a public single online portal to be run by the YOIPO. But in addition, I think um, it is very crucial how and to what extent member states will implement those positions and a good collaboration between cultural heritage institutions and collective management society is fundamental. I think we are in a good situation in Germany. I know there are other countries um, where the situation is totally different. And yes, I, I'm, I'm looking forward what will happen all over Europe. Um, but let me say in Germany, we are in a very comfortable situation. And also I would like to stress that the OIPO database must be easy to use, practicable and complete. Um, in Germany, um, some, some uh, of you will know it already, there's an implementing government draft in the consultation process. And I'm sure that Katharina Anton will give us more detailed information tomorrow in, in another um, uh, section. Um, so yes, so far so good. I'd like to leave it for now. Um, I think there's a lot to do and let's get started, I would say. Thank you, Dorothea. 
Great. So um, something that I, I see in common across the three speakers is that, um, well, the magic word is balance, which decision makers need to figure out what mean, what it, like how to turn it into practice or a reality. And that stakeholder collaboration is the other way to like a fundamental step to make things work. So I was wondering whether you had any, we've got uh, nine more minutes. I was wondering if, if you had any thoughts on how to encourage collaboration at the member state level, given that each of you represent a different sector, which sometimes had polarized views uh, from one another and you still managed to make it work. So any thoughts on how this happens in practice? I think Paul, you were raising your hand. Yes. Um, so there's two things, like there's, there's the ability of member states to, to bring stakeholders together, right? It is uh, generally everybody looks at their respective ministries, be that in some member states, the Ministry of Justice, or in this case, maybe more often the Ministry of Culture. Um, and I think they have, these ministries tend to have strong connections with both the culture heritage sector <clears throat> and the producing parts of, of, of the cultural ecosystem. So the publishers, but also the, associate, the collective management organizations, the rights, generally the rights holder communities. And I think the links in between those two constituencies depends a little bit on the member states are weaker. So I would really um, suggest to the, the member state ministries to take this role that they have, like everybody looking to them, to try to build these connections in between these constituencies, because these links may not be so strong um, in between these two. And uh, I think they have tremendous power, right? Like they have, uh, uh, everybody looks at them, everybody is interested in having a good relationship with their ministries. And so from, from the government side, making that a suggestion that collaboration is really important is I think something that would bring the sector much further. Right. Um, the, the interesting thing to realize here really is that the way copyright is structured, right, like, and also the solutions for out of commerce works that we now have in the directive, like they are not guaranteed to work, right, like there is enough safeguards in for people to step back if they don't trust the situation, if they are not interested in finding a solution, there's enough dead ends in these, but they are structured for the first place if both sides are willing to make things possible that haven't been possible before. And I think that's the, the, the place where, where national legislators should steer the different stakeholders. And I think you were also right. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, although you're muted, Anne. Uh, we cannot hear you, no. Maybe I have to do it myself. Sorry, yeah. I thought you were doing it. Uh, I I agree, and I think it's a good idea. Especially, there's there's a number of country, and and the, the let's not uh, um, be shy about it. I mean, the the discussion about copyright hasn't encouraged cooperation between the parties. So I think that uh, having the ministry asking people to sit around the table and 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 discuss it's, it's a very good idea uh, one of my suggestions would be also that when a, an institution intends to digitize their works it doesn't happen overnight as soon as possible they inform the collective management organization especially again uh, uh, if some of the collection are not published in that country uh, in order for the collective management organization to be able to uh, discuss with sisters organization in other country. So I would say you build confidence also if the plans are announced as early as possible to the, to the other party. I think that, that would be of great help from our sides as we need. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Dorothea, did you have any thoughts on that one? No, not really, because Anne and Paul said it already. I think collaboration between stakeholders is really um, the crucial point and fundamental uh, being successful. And uh, this was always the line of German National Library. And I think it was the good way. Um, we have good experience with that. And we will go on also for other types of work like uh, music and sheet music. Um, this is the next step for us. And yes, I, I think that's really the, the fruitful way. 
Thank you. Any responses to that? Otherwise, I've got another question, maybe the last one for all of you. So, so maybe a slightly odd question, but um, if you look into one or two years from now, what is it that you're really looking forward to? What is it that this directive will change that you really want to see? What is it that you're very satisfied about in this directive? I can start. I think that, I mean, uh, the optimistic scenario is that uh, we have willing parties sitting at the table, that we have a really good instrument with the EYP portal that is used by own parties and that we, uh, in 2026, we come back and we say this has been a success and, and this is something we can build on, we can uh, 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 continue working together and with build confidence. Uh, the, the opposite scenario would be, of course, that uh, there's, there's a failure because of, of a number of reasons to build this consensus between the parties and that the portal would not be efficient enough to inspire confidence to both libraries and publishers in, in, in the cases that uh, occupies me. And, and that we don't have enough uh, results. So I'm going to be optimistic and, and I think we'll have a good uh, solution. If I can just come back quickly on what Paul said about 2026. I think registration requirements is, is a very difficult topic because of the Bern Convention. Because it's, I mean, uh, uh, copyright doesn't require any uh, registration any formalities uh, in order to be attributed. So in case of books, we have, uh, for the sake of being uh, properly um, available in bookshops and in libraries and everything, we have had a system of ISBN for, for a very long time. But I fear that it's going to be very difficult to ask all artists to register their work uh, and, and to put that system in place. Um, and furthermore, that there, there may be some legal issues attached to that. I leave it there, so I leave the uh, floor. So I think we're likely to open another Pandora box here. Uh, maybe, Paul, you want to answer the first question and comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I think this is something that I, I threw that in to have something to discuss, and I think that's maybe for a later discussion to come back to your 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 initial question about the two years, right? Like there's two things I'm really looking forward to. One is maybe a little bit exaggerated. It doesn't go that quick, but like I'm hopeful not to see any Rembrandts made available by museums on websites where it says copyright this or that museum under it in a while because they can't do that anymore. Of course they can still do it anymore, but um, there's now clear legislation around that, that that should not be done. So I'm looking forward to that day. Um, the other thing really, like what, what, what for me would be the trigger over two years, if this directive has an impact or not, is like if over two years we're seeing like the first colleagues uh, working in cultural heritage institutions talking about how they have come up with uh, projects in collaboration, making use of these out of commerce works provisions, and, and, and reaching out to other colleagues and, 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 and trying to explain how that worked and teach them and, and, and basically carry on the message and build capacity to deal with these rules within the sector. And I think that is where Europeana comes again with Europeana's focus on the digital transformation of the sector. Europeana has these very strong networks that can enable these kind of conversations. So for me, over two years, we should see these conversations, how to make these rules work and then it probably takes a little bit longer before we finally notice that a lot more materials are available online, but that will be something that will be the consequence of these dynamics unfolding over the next two years. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Dorothea, I wonder if you want to comment on that? I'm very optimistic um, what will happen in Germany, to be honest, really, because I, um, I think we are on the right path um, because we had already, already experiences, especially in out-of-commerce works, but also tax and data mining, um, preservation rules, and so on. Um, 
I'm not quite sure that we should go the second step before the first. So I think um, the member states have to implement the DSM now and we should um, Yes, go for, for, for more dialogue um, between the national libraries, for instance, or also uh, between uh, publishers and national libraries. But I'm not quite sure whether we can, um, yes, solve all these issues, uh, which um, Paul um, said. I think it's, it's too early. So we have a lot to do. And I think we have tremendous um, differences between different member states. Yeah, thank you, Dorothea. Well, I think, yeah, in any case, Paul, your slide was for 2026, so, uh, so a future quite far away. And yeah, let's focus on what comes next. There's a couple of questions in the Q&A that only came in now. Um, maybe we can do one, uh, even though we're, we're slightly over time. But uh, so there's a question from Bart. Uh, copyright reform happens in steps. And I agree with the speakers that the DSM directive can be a step forward for heritage institutions. But is it also a real step forward for the international audience in an online environment? For example, do licenses granted by a CMO enable heritage institutions to make the material accessible online to everybody worldwide? I don't know if there's any thoughts on that one from any of, or any of you. Oh, it's 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 a very good question. Uh, I would say for the 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 mandating rights holders, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, I think it may be complicated when it comes to the non-mandating rights holders because I'm not sure to which extent the EU rule can apply outside of the European Union. Uh, we asked a question to the Commission, and I think that they uh, they they wisely didn't reply to it. So I I would be careful. However, in most country, I would say the non-mandating rights holders uh, um, might, you know, if, if they are properly informed and, and they have a chance to object if their works are being used, they probably will be okay if their work are licensed. Uh, uh, and just, I mean, I know I'm, I'm, I'm slightly uh, repetitive, but I think it's really important to be careful with the works that would be published in, a, in another country that the one where the library is situated. So those rights holders may have problems if their works are being licensed without uh, proper information and consent. Um, Paul, uh, were you unmuted because you wanted to say something on that? Otherwise, we can. Wrap up. I, I can add a, a tiny little bit, a tiny little bit on it. Like I think it doesn't. There's at least nothing in the directive which prevents the issuing of worldwide licenses, right? So it's not a, not a selfish European thing where it says like we solved this for Europe. I think the ambition of most of the cultural heritage institutions and also platforms like Europeana is, in the end, to make these collections available worldwide, right? And the the point, the important point is, I think, on reference that in the beginning, there's there's two different spheres of circulation, right? Like, and if we're limiting ourselves to those works which are not in commercial circulation anymore, where availability does not interfere with rights holders' intent to uh, benefit from, like to control the work and benefit from the control over the work, we see actually that a lot of creators are extremely happy that their works are made available, given as it will a second life through libraries, through archives, through museums. Like in many, many cases, it is um, actually in line with the intent of the creator as well, or of the rights holders. So I think like in the end, we will, it will need a little bit of balancing. And it's true that we need to be more careful where it's not mandating rights holders. So the extended part of these licenses um, but uh, in, in, in general, I think this will not at least lead to some kind of like limitation of scope to Europe. Thank you very much. Al. That was not an easy question. Um, but this panel was great. I think we need to wrap up now. So thank you so, so much for accepting the invitation. And I'll pass it on to Julia now for closing. Thank, thank you. you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Anne, Dorothea, Paul, and also Ariadna for hosting a very interesting session. I think that also sets us up very nicely for future conversations. We've had a few good uh, questions in the uh, Q&A and chat, and we'll find a way to address those um, after the event. Um, but for now, I'd like to thank everybody, especially those attending um, from a wider audience who've come in um, on the public link to this session.